forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully, in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read Psalm 116 as found in the bulletin. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. How shall I repay the Lord? For all the good things he has done for me. I will lift up the cup of salvation. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord. Is the death of his servants. Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your enemy. You have freed me from my promise. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. A reading from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon, his carrier, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Verily I tell you, 
Servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Me. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will enable us to serve you by loving and caring for one another. Amen. Amen. If I were to ask you how many commandments are there, I suspect that probably a good many would say ten. After all, that's what we learned as we were growing up. But it may not be quite that simple. Because, you see, certain Jewish thought had it that God had not only revealed those commandments written on the tablets, those ten words, but had also communicated a series of oral teachings to Moses which had then been passed down from generation to generation, ultimately leading to that huge fight between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they came up with the number 613. So Orthodox Jews to this day believe that there are 613 commandments. Well, what are we supposed to make of the 10 if that's the case? Many have said that they're a kind of summary, a way of taking all of those commandments, all of those ideas which God had shared with his people, and making it very easy to divide them into categories that ultimately would help people to make sense of them. But what is a commandment? What are commandments all about? It seems to me that we could think of a commandment as an invitation, an invitation to enter into a new way of living, a new way of thinking, of acting, of being. Rather than viewing them as this kind of harsh law which is imposed on us to keep us out of trouble, they in fact were viewed as something that showed and made real and present this loving relationship between God and God's people. And it was something that distinguished them from everyone else around them because they were the only ones who had this kind of law which enabled them to withstand, shall we say, the conflicts and the temptations of the world and to be a unique people in this relationship with God. In fact, you may recall that this was the very goal of the Pharisees, sometimes looked at as being bad people. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Many scholars, in fact, think that Jesus had so much more in common with the Pharisees than the few things which separated them. But the Pharisees, you see, had this great hope. And this great hope was that if they could somehow convince everyone to keep the law of Moses, to observe it, not only externally but with love and devotion from inside, that something wonderful might happen, that that evidence of their love and commitment to God might prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And so it was a sense of longing, a sense of hope, that motivated them to live lives that were holy, lives that were pleasing to God. And to this day, in Jewish synagogues around the world, when young men and women come of age, they're called to come up to the bima to read the Torah, the law, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, that ceremony that realizes and makes real the fact that they are now sons and daughters of the commandment, that they are now in that same relationship with God as their ancestors had been. 
Well then, we might ask ourselves the question, how many commandments did Jesus have? Certainly, many of us think of that famous discourse in which Jesus spoke of two commandments, that commandment of loving our God and of loving our neighbor. But he went further and also suggested that we love ourselves. So perhaps there were three commandments, or perhaps there were two. At the conclusion of the Gospel of Matthew, when he sends out his disciples, he tells them to go and to do three things. Go, he says, into all the world, teach and baptize. So perhaps there are three more commandments. At the Eucharist in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke, and as we heard in this passage from Paul as well, he tells them to do what he has done in remembrance of him, speaking these words of his body and of his blood. So perhaps there are two more commandments. In the Gospel of John, it's very interesting. One might say, how many commandments are there? How many commandments did Jesus reveal to us in the Gospel of John? Well, it's interesting because in John, we don't have a retelling of the Last Supper in the way that we do in the Synoptics. John does something different. The different thing that he does is to present us with this account of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. And it's certainly something that we'll be reflecting on this evening. But he tells them that he gives them a new commandment, a mandatum in Latin. And from that mandatum, we get the word mandi, a day in which we celebrate that commandment that Jesus gave us. And it's interesting because what Jesus actually says is that the new commandment that he gives is that we love one another. Another commandment, it seems, by Jesus. What is Maundy Thursday all about anyway? Why is it that we celebrate on this Thursday night at the beginning of the Triduum of those three holy days that contain the essential core of what it means for us to be Christians? Holy Thursday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and then of course that time of silence in the tomb leading up to the glorious resurrection of our Lord. Well, scripture scholars are fighting over this, as you might imagine. Was it a Seder? What kind of a meal was it? And it all depends in large part on how they interpret several esoteric verses. For our sake, I don't think that it really matters. I think that what matters is that Jesus has this special meal with his closest and dearest friends, with those who have become his new family, and he shares with them the very essence of what his ministry has been about from the very beginning up to that moment. It was a Paschal meal, whether it was a Seder or not, because it was a meal in which he separated from the other time that he had been with them and focuses on this reality of God's loving and saving deliverance. It is a moment in which he celebrates that reality of deliverance, of freedom. But perhaps even more importantly, it is a celebration of God's providence, a celebration that God provides with such generosity that the needs of every person are met. It is an invitation to a life of thanks. It is an invitation to a Eucharistic lifestyle. When I lived in the Bronx, I had the occasion of often going to these Greek delis, which I loved. Chicken souvlaki is the best thing I think ever invented. But it was such a great joy in speaking with the owners of the deli. And whenever I would say something kind to them, they would always respond, Ev caristo, Eucharist, thank you. Eu, good caris, grace. Celebrating that good grace that God gives in such abundance. And because of that, Judaism was a faith that gave thanks for everything that God gave. There was a blessing for everything, but especially a blessing for those essential elements in life, most importantly for bread and wine. A blessing that was celebrated each Friday night 
as that family prepared to enter into the Sabbath. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Amoti lehemin haaretz, Amen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has brought forth bread from the earth. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei peri hagafen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. But Jesus did something different that Maundy Thursday night. After they completed this meal in which they had given thanks, he did something surprising. Clearly, Peter was taken by surprise. And I suspect that he probably is speaking for all of the other disciples who didn't quite know what was going on. What was Jesus up to? Because Lord and Master and Teacher as he was, he did what a servant would do. He washed their tired, dusty feet. As they might say in Western North Carolina, it was an old-fashioned foot washing that took place. A way for him to not only demonstrate his care for them, his love for them, but to give them an example of what it meant to be fortified by that Eucharist, by that bread and wine, to be empowered for a life of ministry and of service, a life of thanksgiving. I'm fascinated. Why is it that foot washing was not a sacrament? <coughs> there seems to be as much evidence for it as for the other things that, that we might think of, especially for baptism or for the Eucharist. But even if it wasn't a sacrament, it is clearly sacramental because this action demonstrates the reality of God's love. It is a way of giving thanks for the gift of each person whose feet are washed. It is a way of giving thanks for these relationships that bind and unite and hold people together. It is a way of giving thanks by loving service to each other. When all is said and done, our Lord speaks to us as clearly as possible. I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Amen. invite those who have been asked to represent the two congregations to please take one of the chairs and uh, as we prepare for the foot washing. Fellow servants of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet, an act of humble service. He taught that strength and growth in the life of the kingdom of God come not by power, nor authority, or even miracle, but by such lowly service. We all need to remember his example, but none stand more in need of this reminder than those whom the Lord has called to the ordained ministry. Therefore, I invite you, who have been appointed as representatives of our congregations and who share in the royal priesthood of Christ, to come forward that we may recall whose servants we are by following the example of our master. But come remembering his admonition that what will be done for you is also to be done by you to others. For a servant is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you 
if you do them. stand in prayers of the people. With faith and love and in union with Christ, let us offer our prayers before you the throne of grace, saying after each petition, Lord, hear our prayer. Holy God, as we walk in the way of the cross in this holy week, have mercy on your people for whom your son laid down his life, we pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Unite people of faith in the ministry of reconciliation and bind us to together in sacrificial love of Christ. We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Bring healing and wholesome wholeness to the people and nations and have pity on those torn apart by division. We pray to the Lord, Strengthen all who are persecuted for your name's sake and deliver from them evil. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
Look in mercy upon all who suffer and hear those who cry out in pain and desolation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Bring, com bring comfort to the dying and gladden their hearts with the power of your glory and the hope of resurrection. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Give the rest to the departed and bring them with your saints to the glory everlasting. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. with the words of St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. For there is a faith in us so love. For there is a sin in your heart. For there is a power in you. For there is a power of faith. For there is a spirit of hope. For there is darkness of light. For there is sadness of joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To understand as to understand. To be loved is just to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So let us confess our sins against God. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Drabo, please stand. It's a sign of peace and of reconciliation. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I'm also with you.
Please be seated. Welcome to you all. What a joy it is for us to worship together this evening. I know we have visitors with us, friends with us, and our two congregations together. We've been able to share so much of Lent together. What a joy that has been. I know, speaking for us folks from Bangor to visit at St. Thomas and, and to welcome the folks tonight from St. Thomas and Father Miller, thank you so much for your words and your ministry and your presence with us. As I say, this was the night that Jesus also prayed that we might be one. This world is too divided. This is a night we proclaim the unity of the gospel good news, the love of God. And so I pray that that will be with all of us tonight. This liturgy concludes in a unique way. Let me just give a word of explanation if this would be new to you. Following the receiving of communion, and all baptized Christians are certainly welcome to do so. Uh, following that, we will have our normal prayer of, of uh, thanksgiving and a blessing, and then there will be a kneeling hymn. During the kneeling hymn, um, Father Miller and I will prepare ourselves for the solemn stripping of the altar. So as the hymn concludes, either remain kneeling or seated, but in silence, as we prepare the altar, as we transition to our reflection on the death of Jesus on the cross for Good Friday. And as the service concludes in a few minutes after that, I would ask you to keep a rule of silence as you leave the church. May this time be a time that we draw near to one another and to our Lord in his suffering and in his love. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For our sins, he was lifted high upon the cross, that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, come. thy will be done, done. on earth and as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, bread. and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory, glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace.
pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, abide with you and keep you, and those you hold in love this night and always. Amen. The kneeling hymn is hymn 329.